Hello, everybody. How are you all doing? Welcome to Room for Discussion. Uh, we're hoping that you're all safe and healthy and staying home. Uh, this is our first podcast, and we intend to keep you. We intend to keep you busy uh, for this time, so we're not going anywhere. Uh, and we'll have some interesting content uh, coming your way uh, in the next, in the coming weeks. Um, so today we're delighted to welcome a renowned economist, British economist, John Kay. Welcome, Professor Kay. Nice to be with you. So uh, you've written a, a book that was just published uh, this March, Radical Uncertainty. I want to start by discussing that. Um, could you just start by telling us what is radical uncertainty exactly, just to gra grasp that concept? Right. If we go back 100 years, people Hello? used to radically and uncertainty, which couldn't. Mm -hmm. Sorry, again? Economists and other... Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But economists in the last 50 years or so, and other, other subjects as well, have essentially abandoned that distinction and assumed you could talk about every kind of uncertainty mm -hmm. in right. probabilistic terms. We argue you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the ways in which you approach because this... Probabilistic... Oh, sorry. Yeah, continue, please. Yeah. So... Uh, we approach it rather differently and say that uncertainty arises because you have imperfect information. Mm -hmm. And if you have imperfect information, you can try and resolve that. You can try and resolve it in one of two ways. One is um, you can get further information. Uh, you may not know what the capital of the Netherlands is. Mm -hmm. You probably think it's Amsterdam if you're not, <laughs> if you're not Dutch. Uh, but if you you don't know that, you can look it up. You can also say, and this is quite interesting, it's likely that it's Amsterdam because you apply the general rule that the, the largest city is the capital. So London is the capital of the UK, Paris is the capital of France, and so on. So there's a difference there between likelihood and probability. The question of what's the probability that Amsterdam is the capital of the Netherlands is absurd. It either is or it isn't. Mm -hmm. And if it, and I do in fact know that it's the Hague, not <laughs> not Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Or you can resolve it by specifying a probability distribution. And we, the, the, what you can do this is where uh, modern probabilistic mathematics began in the 17th century, mm -hmm. applying it to games of chance to card games, to tossing a coin, and things like that. And people then realized that you could apply that to other areas, like mortality statistics and the like. Mm -hmm. yeah. But gradually, people yeah. extended the, that kind of thing. So if you ask, what was the probability that a coronavirus outbreak would break, break out in Wuhan in December 2019? That's just not a question to which you can give a sensible answer. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah it's, yeah, it's just absurd in talking these terms. But then, if I understand you correctly, in your book, uh, you essentially spell out that there was this debate between two schools of ec economics. So on one, you had Knight and uh, Keynes, um, who, who were sort of against this thinking in excessive probability. And on the other, we uh, see another like, Chicago school, I think you talk about. So was it just a, a lost battle by, by the former that, that led to the situation? or? Um, it was, in a, in a curious way, it was a European-American yeah. contest. Hmm. There was a very famous dinner party in Paris in 1952, where there was a debate between some Europeans and, um, and uh, some Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, the Americans, the Chicago school, basically. The Europeans from various countries. Mm -hmm. And one of the proponents in that debate, Maurice Allais, a Frenchman, wrote up an article summarizing the debate then as a critique of the postulates of the American school. He published it in French, actually, and you couldn't publish an article in a major economics journal mm -hmm. in French, which shows how some things have changed, particularly that, that, that thing. Because in the end, the Americans won that debate more or less comprehensively. Mm -hmm. And they won it, essentially, because this probabilistic reasoning is rather easy to quantify and mathematize. Mm -hmm. And all the pressure on us has been to mathematize and quantify. Mm -hmm. And of course, we, we see that now, where people are 
developing models uh, of what will happen with the coronavirus. And these models are really quite useful in enabling you to see what the key parameters are. Mm -hmm. But the difficulty we have is that we do not know what these parameters are. We do not know we do not know how many people have actually this infection. And most importantly, we don't know what is the key to the spread of any infection, which is how many people are infected by someone who already has the disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing you talk about in your book, one of your main arguments is that in order to kind of counter the hegemony of this kind of statistical probability reasoning that economics has had, uh, we need to start thinking more in terms of narratives. Could you yes. explain what you mean by that? Uh, most people actually don't think probabilistically. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience is even talking to like, audience of actuaries, when you give them real problems in everyday life, they don't think probabilistically. People think in terms of stories. That's how humans actually operate. Mm -hmm. And that's really how you cope, how, how we try to cope with an uncertain world. We tell ourselves stories about it, and if we're if we're sensibly planning in business or in finance or indeed in life, what we should be thinking of doing is framing kind of realistic reference narrative, and then asking ourselves the question: What are the risks that might derail that narrative? Mm -hmm. It's part of the confusion here. Uh, I'm saying that people used to distinguish risk and uncertainty, but now don't. That's true of economists and statisticians. It's not true of ordinary people. For ordinary people, risk is something bad, whereas uncertainty may be either good or bad. You will never hear anyone say there's a risk I might win the lottery, <laughs> or even that there's a risk they might not win the lottery, because people don't really expect to win the lottery. There's uncertainty about the outcome of the lottery, but there's not risk in that sense. Risk is something bad. Uncertainty may be good or bad. Good uncertainties are going to a new place, a new restaurant, when you're allowed to go to restaurants, uh, or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, and you don't know what you're going to encounter. Yeah. And what um, this, this sort of dichotomy between risk and uncertainty, it really sounds as th th this could have serious implications for financial markets, uh, our, our visualization of the uh, macroeconomics, essentially. And uh, could, you, could you give us a couple of examples of where this really comes across? I think you talk about the financial crisis quite a lot in, in your book. Uh, maybe uh, you give us a couple of examples for the audience to understand where this yeah, could lead us. We do. We start the book with a famous example where uh, when the financial crisis started breaking out in 2007, David Vinyar, who was then the CFO of Goldman Sachs, said we've experienced 25 standard deviation events several days in a row. Mm -hmm. Now, you know you don't experience 25 <laughs> deviation events at all, far less several days in a row. What he meant, or at any rate what he should have meant, was that... Um, these events were essentially impossible within the framework of the Goldman Sachs model. But that was a critique of the Goldman Sachs model. Mm -hmm. And in order to translate a probability from the Goldman Sachs model to a probability about, about the world, you need to multiply the probability from the model by the probability that the Goldman Sachs model is true, a true description of the world. But... Mm -hmm. We don't know what that probability is, except that it's mm -hmm. extremely low. Mm -hmm. So you cannot generalize statements from a, a model into statements about the world, into the way, it's so not just that Vinyar was trying to do, but the whole structure of financial regulation mm -hmm. was and still is trying to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one of the examples you touch also upon in your book is uh, as examples of successful investors who kind of used uh, a more interpretive approach, for example, Warren Buffett or George Soros, uh, and, and were able to be very successful. Um, so do you think uh, people in Wall Street should be thinking more in terms of narratives or should they read more history? I, I, I think they should certainly read more history. <laughs> and when we were talking a moment ago about abolishing this distinction between risk and uncertainty, you know that in financial markets and the kind of models people use there, not only are risk and uncertainty treated as being the same thing, mm -hmm. but they're equated with asset price volatility. 
so that we've lost a, a lot of richness of understanding. And actually, uh, this is simply not, as I was describing earlier, what ordinary people mean by risk. Now, if we take that on board, we have to accept that asking people and firms about their risk appetite and risk aversion is pretty meaningless. And more than that, the, the whole structure of financial modeling based around capital asset pricing model really has to be um, rethought in a fundamental way. And I'm afraid you're right that what is going on here is people are trying to quantify things that don't really lend themselves to the kind of quantitative description they want to give them. Mm -hmm. So I'm having a difficult time in trying to conceptualize how do we become more narrative uh, centered, f focused? How do we, uh, like in our studies of economics and policy making, um, could you explain what does it mean to be more narrative and how can we see that in, in policy making, in economic discourse? Yeah. Well, well, let's go back to the example we were just talking about of right. people saving for the future. And if they go to a, an advisor who builds a model using capital asset pricing model standard, standard economic techniques, uh, what will happen will be he will ask about uh, their risk appetite. And if, they, if they were very sophisticated yeah. mathematically, he'd say, I want to know the second derivative of your utility. And then he would direct people away from volatile assets, depending on what their risk preference, their risk appetite, measured in this kind of way is. Now, that ends up with a world in which as people are getting up towards retirement, you're going to put a large part of it in bonds because you're saying that is relatively low asset price of volatility. Let's turn all that argument around and have your financial advisor ask I'm trying to establish what is your reference narrative? What is your it, that you're wanting me to help you to achieve? And the answer to that is likely to be something. I, I want to be able to enjoy a reasonably high standard of living for a, the rest of my life, which I hope will be a reasonably long time. Now start thinking that through, and you realize that um, uh, if you're only going to live for five years, Asset price volatility doesn't matter doesn't matter much because who cares? If you're going to live for 25 years, asset price volatility doesn't matter very much either because it's going to even out over 25 years. What you should be looking for is something that will generate a high enough return to enable you to enjoy a high standard of living over what, what's left of your life. So financial advisors are directing people into um, low volatility assets, which are not in fact safe in the sense that they don't contribute uh, to achieving people's reference narratives. Mm -hmm. To make the point, I, I often use the example of pointing out that certainty and security are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. If I tell you you're going to be hanged tomorrow, you have certainty, but you don't have security. And that's a bit like what we're now promising pensioners. We guarantee you for certain you're going to have a very low standard of living in retirement. And that's not clever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, another thing that you touch upon in, in this whole frame of narrative thinking in, in, in your book is uh, in policy making, you say that oftentimes when sticking to these leading narratives or these models, uh, economists try to uh, extrapolate these model, these small uh, sort of s stationary models to a larger world, which are often imperfect and, and completely different. Um, and obviously, intuitively, that that that, that is uh, faulty and by design. Uh, but your alternative is uh, what it seems like we should be evaluating in less probabilistic terms and say, like, uh, was like I'm less certain or this is likely, but this is more likely. So talk in this kind of language and more, you know, everyday language. Uh, and also what you recommend uh, is, is sometimes the best answer is, I don't know. Is that correct? Um, yeah, and very often the, the best answer is, I don't know. But but what is... And, you know, right now, how will this coronavirus crisis yeah. work itself yeah. out? But is this not but, harmful, t taking, I don't know, for an answer? I mean, 
Um, yeah. world is, we're all here about progress and sort of at least trying to make the best out of the situation and saying, I don't know, like if we're hearing a politician say, I don't know about what's going to happen with coronavirus. I don't know what measures we should take. I don't know what the conduct of monetary policy should be like. You know, where do we end up with this thinking? Yeah, uh, to say I don't know, to say what measures should we take, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You can see why politicians don't like giving the answer, yeah. I don't know. Uh, but we need we need to distinguish then the situations where I don't know has to be the answer, which is how will this crisis evolve? Mm -hmm. To what measures should we take? And I don't know. And that that's it's like what is the call of the Netherlands? Mm -hmm. uh, it, you probably don't know, but you'd better try and do your best to get to an answer. Mm -hmm. You want to make that a resolvable uncertainty. You may not get to the right answer, mm -hmm. but you, you want to get further information mm -hmm. until you reach an answer. Okay. And you know, one of the things that is striking me more and more about this crisis is how little we're doing to get the kind of information we need in order to make good decisions. We don't really know what the infected population is. Mm -hmm. We don't really know what the mortality rate is. We don't know what that critical parameter of how many people does an infected person infect. Mm -hmm. Right, but, but we're trying to find out, no? Sorry? But but there are efforts to keep statistics of these things. They're obviously imperfect um, just because of the time factor, but, but we are trying um, to, to um, do something. They're, they're very imperfect, and people mm -hmm. are not talking about doing that kind of thing. In, uh, a disciplined sort of way. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been talking to people about the idea that what we ought to do is actually test a random mm -hmm. sample of the population, the way we do with an opinion poll, for example. Yeah. So that's the only way we can actually find out uh, what the infection rate, what the, the nature of the size of the infected population actually is. And it's probably very much, well, it's certainly Hello? Sorry, could you repeat it? Oh, we have a connection problem. Is there the okay. best estimate we have of the mortality rate from this disease? Mm -hmm is created by the uh, the people who are on one of these cruise ships. Right, so the, the, the Diamond Princess. We know exactly what the population yeah. of people who had this virus actually was from the cruise ship. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that is it's quite low, below 1%. Mm -hmm. Although actually the people who are on a cruise ship, well, it's slightly difficult because people who are on a cruise are older than the population yeah. as a whole, mm -hmm. but they're also more affluent. Yeah. And being older is bad, but being affluent is good. Yeah. But it's, uh, it, it, it's the kind of thing that gives an example. And we need, as it were, a sample selected in an appropriate way to give us the right answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Similarly, we're almost certainly exaggerating the death rate from coronavirus. Because if people are die, the people we measure as dying from coronavirus are people who die who have coronavirus at the time at which they die. But a great many people are people who um, have various respiratory problems, mm -hmm. and among them is coronavirus. So what we really want to know, and we can't know, is how many people are dying who would not have died within, let's say, a three-month interval if they didn't have coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, now that we're on the topic of, of coronavirus, um, since we both read your book, we uh, uh, recall you saying that uh, the exact quote, we must expect to be hit by an epidemic of an infectious disease resulting from a virus which does not yet exist. Um, and judging by the situation, how it's... wrote that six months ago, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The book was just, just, just published, essentially, and uh, <laughs> you're sort of a fortune teller, or, or, or have we just planned this interview so well to fall in this date? Is, um, or maybe the virus planned its out. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we engineered the virus in order to sell more copies. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly has. Have the have the sales gone up? But in in this uh, time frame, 
Uh, well, it, it it was published on on March the on March the fifth when right. all this news was just about breaking. Oh, yeah. It's hard to say what the effect on sales has actually been. <laughs> well, we're yet. To... There's been one big negative. We held a number of events to talk about it, uh, but uh, after about a week, all the remaining events were cancelled. Yeah. 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 Um, well, one of the things which uh, kind of interested us when we were kind of looking at the responses to the crisis right now is that, um, well, well, first of all, how do we get from a, a virus, a viral outbreak to a global economic crisis that is in many levels on par with and even exceeds the, the 2008 financial crisis? Well, all these crises are different. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this crisis is caused basically by two things. One is the disruption to global supply chains mm -hmm. uh, that has come as a result of it. And the second is the consequences of, of lockdown, mm -hmm. yeah. which both affect, affect production directly mm -hmm. and affect consumption of a whole range of goods people can only consume by leaving home, from restaurant meals to haircuts. Mm -hmm. Sure. And yeah. then, of course, there's the effect on uh, finance and liquidity mm -hmm. that arises from these two underlying problems. Mm -hmm. Well, for conceptualization for our audience, uh, because we, we also have non-economists listening to this, and uh, to get from sort of point A, the, the epidemic of the virus, to sort of point C, um, the... Uh, uh, collapse of the stock markets across the globe. Like what? What it, uh, to explain in simple words? Because it, you spoke about the supply chains uh, and then the problems with liquidity and the, uh, as a result of lockdown, uh, etc. Um, how do we explain this to, to the, the general populace? Like, what, what, what uh, now the supply chain problems are are quite interesting because yeah. for the last twenty thirty years around the world, we've both been creating these long complex supply chains one of the large effects of globalization and we've also gone for what people have called lean production just in time management mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on so you create you create efficiencies by taking out what we describe in the book as robustness and resilience mm -hmm. um, in your in your production activities that it the robustness and resilience is very important as a means of dealing with uncertainty if you if you're an engineer building a bridge or designing a complex piece of piece of machinery, you don't do what let's say banks and financial regulators do, which is to calculate what is the minimum I need mm -hmm. in order to um, in order to make this thing appear safe. Mm -hmm. uh, you calculate that number and then you add quite a large amount to it. We also design systems to be modular, which means that if part of the system breaks down, and systems always do break down, that um, breakdown will not lead to the collapse of the system as a whole. So modularity and resilience are very important characteristics of strategies for dealing with uncertainty. One of the things we've done, a big thing we've done in the global production system in the last 20, well, really through 50 years, has been to regard that kind of modularity and resilience, redundancy, as signs of inefficiency and, uh, and try to eliminate them. And we're paying some of the price for that in the economic dislocation which we're now seeing. Mm -hmm. And how would you contextualize uh, some of the, the responses of the governments, especially in Europe, to, to what's going on right now? We've seen, for example, the PPP, uh, essentially the ECB, injecting 700 billion euros into the economy and these kind of ways of uh, what some people have called helicopter money in, to, to deal with the crisis. And how would you interpret uh, also with regards to what you mentioned as doing the minimum possible uh, or, or doing the minimum needed to contain the situation? Well, I don't think there's any question here of doing the minimum needed to contain the situation. Mm -hmm. Indeed, it's almost been the other way around, I think, that European leaders have each had to appear 
not to be less forceful than others in the measures they announce to try and deal with it. Mm -hmm. So you've almost had a competition in which you hear people saying, if, if they're doing all this in Italy or Germany, why are we not doing the same thing here? And um, that was heard, and the response to that was eventually, well, now we are. So I don't think people are doing the minimum. Uh, but I, I had a colleague who just um, said to me the other day, uh, I'm going to get out my copy of How to Pay for the War, which was a book came <laughs> about in 1940. And I, I can see exactly why, because it is um, pretty much the situation where you don't care very much about the long-term financial consequences, because you will, if you survive, you will fix them up later, as it were. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But it seems to me, um, at least to some extent, that uh, European policymakers uh, are becoming a bit more resilient in the sense that uh, the response uh, to this crisis has been very rapid within a month essentially uh, a lot of measures were taken compared to, for example, the 2008 crisis where there was much less consensus, there was much less collective decision making. Uh, so do you think in a sense we are approaching uh, sort of a, a better model for decision making? Well, I'm, I'm not sure you're right, actually. Back in 2008, mm -hmm. there were both elements of national decision making and elements of, of, of global European decision making. Uh, that countries largely bailed out their own banks and there was some international agreement on measures to, to deal with the problems afterwards. But it was largely a matter of uh, uh, national reactions. My co-author Mervyn King said at the time that uh, banks are global in life but national in, debt, in death. And that was exactly how it worked out mm -hmm. in 2008. Mm -hmm. And I think we've so seen the same thing really here in um, in coronavirus, that uh, Europe has been acting as 27 countries rather than as a, a European Union in this. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that you mention this because um, you've correctly said the European leaders have been trying to appear strong and take robust measures. But let's... If we look at it from uh, the perspective of uh, an ordinary European citizen, uh, well, maybe not so ordinary. If you take take a look at it, uh, take a perspective of an Italian individual, how they're looking at it. Um, you know, we had the euro crisis, we had the migration crisis, and now we have a European-wide um, health crisis. My question is, when when uh, when all this goes, will we see um, the population of Italy uh, and people around Europe questioning European ability to sustain a crisis? I suspect the answer to that is yes. Mm. I'm, I'm a generation or two older than you mm. and I start to look back and think maybe I was pretty lucky in the years I lived through mm. yeah. which were one of the most stable periods in, in European history mm -hmm. and things Things have be that that has become less true, much less true, really, since the uh, since the financial crisis, both in terms of events we're talking about happening, like um, uh, like these crises, and in terms of the structure of European politics, which had was fairly stable along a left-right axis for a hundred years, and that axis you can now see disintegrating in front of us. Yeah, and. Uh so there's a, you would say there's a risk of uh, polarizing the union even further. Uh, I think that's right. Yeah. Polarizing the un both the union as a whole yeah. and the politics of individual countries within it, mm -hmm. which do start to look very different. Mm -hmm. But let's look on the other side. There are as a frequent discussion amongst the pro-Europeans that actually in times like this, what we need is further integration. This was discussed in the financial crisis, sorry, in the euro crisis of uh, creating a closer um, monetary and fiscal ties. Obviously, that hasn't been realized sufficiently to this day. Um, we will also be hearing probably European politicians talking about further integration fiscally um, and maybe in any other relevant means. Uh, do you think that that is also another sort of the opposite side to that that, that could take place, push towards further uh -huh. integration? 
I'm not very convinced. Well, I'm convinced that what you're saying is true. Mm -hmm. But I think in Britain, I don't have very many Lever friends, but I do have some. Mm -hmm. And if I talk to most of the ones who do, uh, they point to the experience they've had, which indeed I've had of going to Brussels and you see people for whom whatever the question is, the answer is more Europe, that, yeah. that, that mm -hmm. needs to be more integration. And I think the resentment of that, particularly in Britain, but I think in many other countries around the European Union, is one of the problems the, the Union has. And I think the, the creation of the Euro is probably the largest example of that. Yeah. That there has been a tendency to say, let us push integration as far as we can and hope that underlying integration and underlying public opinion will follow. And the truth is, I think for the first 30, 40 years of the EU, that worked pretty well. I think it was the creation of the euro that started pushing it a bit further than, than it could go. Mm -hmm. And as I see it, the euro was a rather ambitious product, project to create a monetary union between Germany and the countries around Germany, like the Netherlands and France. Mm -hmm. But once you added Italy and Spain and Greece and the like to that, you were creating a very different structure, a very different dynamic, mm -hmm. and one is that, that has proved not to be stable mm -hmm. and may in the long run prove not to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yet that is very specific to the euro crisis, but in terms of the health crisis, uh, as we're facing now, isn't the argument that closer union, uh, or a fiscal union in fact, would have helped us to stimulate the economies of, of countries like Italy, of countries like Spain uh, and Greece in this uneasy time? Well, I don't, I, re hmm. I don't think Italian responses have been constrained by their fiscal situation. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the striking things about the debate in Europe is that the debate about debt levels and uh, fiscal austerity, mm -hmm. which has dominated European economic policy making really a decade, it's now entirely gone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> governments will do wh wh whatever it takes <laughs> yeah. in fiscal terms as well as in. Or will they though? Because uh, in terms. what we've seen now is that you know there was talk about the euro bonds um, as to support the Italian economy, support the European economy as a whole. And we've seen uh, even Germany coming, uh, coming up with, uh, with, with some level of support, uh, whilst the Netherlands have uh, bluntly rejected it. So are they really doing all that it takes? Right. But, but what has happened there has been that you're, the, the responses have been essentially national. Yeah. The fiscal yeah. responses have been large, but they've, taken, they, they've been taken on at the national level. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious there's a desire, well, on the part of two groups. One is the Italians and other Southern Europeans. Mm -hmm. And the other is people who want to create ever closer union mm -hmm. to, say that, to say that the answer to that is euro bonds. Mm -hmm. But bluntly, if one's uh, being cynical, there is almost um, there are people for whom the answer to almost any economic question in the EU mm -hmm. is it would be better if we have euro bonds. Uh, I mean, one of the issues that, I've, that has also sort of come up is um, with basically should the EU develop its own kind of public, supranational public health body in order to deal with this? Uh, because right now the European Union has essentially um, added another major problem into its already existing body of problems, immigration, uh, the financial crisis and its aftermath, and now public health. So should the European Union uh, do something in this respect? Or do you think it's just a black swan that we will never have to create a supranational health system to deal with this? Uh, no, I mean, this uh, This is not a black swan in the mm. sense in which um, a black swan has typically been something that you couldn't attach a probability to because you couldn't even visualize it. I illustrate that by saying you can't attach a probability to inventing the wheel. Yeah, yeah. Because if you could attach a probability, you've already invented the wheel. Uh, so this was, it was entirely predictable that an event of this kind would happen at some time. And you quoted earlier the quote 
which we had in the book that said something like that, this mm -hmm. will happen at some time, mm -hmm. and something like this will happen again. Mm -hmm. And you're right that we need supranational um, efforts to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, and more than the European level, I think, you know, there is, was formed in 2017, and it's exactly the kind of thing we need, a center for epidemic preparedness, and innovation. Mm -hmm. mm. It's interesting that the big players in that did not include Europe. It was Norway, United States, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, at least here in the UK. Mm -hmm. yeah. But simply the existence of that probably means we will get a vaccine or the progress towards a vaccine mm -hmm. for this uh, disease is likely to be faster than it would otherwise have been. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And, and that's, well, that's the kind of ways in which we should be thinking about coping with radical uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I see. And uh, so what you're suggesting is one of the ways in which we can deal with it is through more innovation or at least spending more time, um, not necessarily creating statistics, but basically, yeah, innovating. Um, and another kind of... Uh, I don't want to call it a black swan, but a kind of unknown that we might be facing very soon, and we are already to some extent, is climate change. Um, so how can how can we take some of the insights in your book and kind of apply them to dealing with uh, climate change on a global level or nationally? Yeah, um, we've been we've been talking about as it were technological responses to um, uh, uh, to, to coronavirus and pandemics generally. Mm -hmm. And much of this, uh, much of the way in which we deal with these kind of existential uncertainties mm -hmm. is, I think, by developing technologies which will help you deal with them as they arise. Now, it seems to me that is very much true of climate change. And to my mind, the solutions are very largely technological. Mm -hmm. The largest problem we have, as I see it in relation to climate change, it's not what we do in Europe, because Europe, what Europe does in terms of emissions is not going to be material on a, on a global scale. Mm -hmm. What matters is to enable Asia and hopefully Africa as well mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. to grow and achieve something like European levels of prosperity without vast, vast increases in carbon emissions. And the solutions to that are going to be lower cost, carbon neutral, or carbon reducing energy technologies mm -hmm. and if we could make more progress in electricity transmission and in electricity storage that's a, a major game changer even as in quite the short quite a short term we are making quite a lot of progress in batteries right um right. if we could do it in terms of transmission well there's enough sun in the sahara to um power the world for a long time <laughs> We could turn us into electricity. That would be interesting it. to see. Yeah. Well, so. it, it, it is by no means impossible. You, you have the physical transmission of electricity. You also are using that power to, to create hydrogen, which is a transportable fuel, Yeah, yeah. and so on. Uh, so. The, these are the kind of things we're thinking about. I, one of the things I regret is that the whole climate change debate is so much framed in sort of moralizing terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm rather than in terms of looking for specific, feasible measures we can take. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Just before I go into my next question, I just want to remind uh, our audience that they do have a chance to ask you some questions, uh, and they can do so in the, in the live stream on Facebook, um, and then we'll have um, around in about five or so minutes. Uh, if not, then we will continue with our interview. So my question, now that we spoke about environment, uh, um, I want to bring in the topic of the oil market currently, which I, I think that will have repercussions on the future steps towards more environmentally uh, friendly policy. But looking at it now, um, what are your projections for uh, what's going to happen with uh, with the current sort of oil crisis that we're experiencing with uh, um, the OPEC plus uh, <coughs> Russia agreement, the United States? Uh, what are your projections on that? Well. There are two quite separate things going on at the moment, which uh, come together in a strange confluence. One is the coronavirus crisis and the effect of that on transport and production. 
and the other is essentially the the spat, particularly between Russia and um, and Saudi Arabia, yeah. uh, which has led to the chaos we've seen in the oil market. Um, I'm not a political analyst, so I'm certainly not going to tell you how <laughs> relations between these parts are going to uh -huh. are going to work out. Yeah. Um, except that oil prices might go very low in some in short, some short term. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, we're going to be using quite a lot of oil for quite a long time. And whatever pressures we put on Western suppliers, I think we can be pretty confident that uh, Saudi Aramco and Rosneft are going to be producing quite a lot of oil for the foreseeable future. Sure, yeah. There are, there are talks that uh, this 10 million barrels a day reduction uh, is just to save time, to, 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 to give them time to prepare for uh, the shutdowns that they're going to face in the near future anyway, right? Um, yeah, but looking at the American context is quite interesting because what we're seeing is the shale uh, oil industry is is in a state of well, near collapse. We're having uh, the Whiting Petroleum filing for bankruptcy. Um, you know, the, the, clearly the situation is unsustainable and is leading to uh, growing unemployment in the sector in the United States. Are we are we going to see an outright collapse of oil industry in the United States, or shale oil in particular? Well, that capacity to produce is still there mm -hmm. uh, once oil prices rise to a higher level. I mean, one of the things, and it would be interesting to see how this works out, because there's a general observation about the current crisis, is you have a lot of activities where there is going to be demand in the long run. You know, people are going to be eating restaurant meals, going to bars, mm -hmm. They're going to be traveling around the world and so on. Yeah. Uh, but it may be that the particular organizations which are supplying these services at the moment fail to survive the crisis. Now, that's partly, I think, a matter yeah. for public policy. How do we ensure that when there is, again, demand for these products, there are, there are businesses which are capable of supplying them? And that poses quite tricky challenges for, I think, industrial policy in all our countries. Um, uh, but it's also a matter of uh, how does this relate to finance and stock markets? Because we can see a lot of firms disappearing, even if the activities in which these firms are engaged don't. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, well, naturally, my hunch is that uh, uh, if the there's a loss of confidence in uh, in investment on in uh, uh, oil firms. Uh, it, it's just a ripple effect on airlines, uh, other competitors. Uh, we've seen that uh, the yields on bonds of competitor oil firms are going up because the investors are losing confidence generally in the market entirely. So, uh, would you say would you say it, it is that sort of thinking? Am I correct in assuming this? That it is just a ripple sort of effect. Um. I think it is a ripple, but the, the fabulous instability that we've had in the oil price market over the last 10 years, you know, to have a stable, basically, a stable constantly in demand product and prices of varied between 20 and $150. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stop. My thoughts are with the oil dependent countries, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, we do have a question from the audience, Professor Kay, and uh, maybe this goes back a little bit uh, to the content of our interview, but uh, the question is, what do you see as the negative effects of maintaining benchmark interest rates at very low or, or negative rates for years? It's really a permanent distortion in the structure of the economy. Mm -hmm. And one of problem which quantitative easing raised right from the beginning was how do we ever escape from this without imposing major disruption on the economy mm -hmm. and so far every attempt uh, uh, to escape from it has created a potential element of that disruption mm -hmm. with the result that it's either been rolled back or certainly not followed back further and I think it's quite interesting talking about this in discussion with people that in some ways the lockdown policies of major governments now have similar effects. How do you actually plan your exit from this? 
-hmm. And there's probably a general rule there for how you should think about dealing with uncertainty, mm -hmm. which is don't adopt on radical and conventional policies without giving some thought to how you're going to escape from them. I think there may well be difficulties around the West mm -hmm. uh, when we try to unwind these, these lockdown policies that are in place at the moment. And the radical and conventional methods are lockdowns, in your opinion? Or, or is yes. There something, what, about, what about the helicopter money, the, the, um, giving people free cash? Is that unconventional? It's unconventional, and I don't, I don't see what is gained by it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's perfectly sensible to provide people who are losing income as a result of this crisis uh, with it. Mm -hmm. You think but it is sensible? And right, and right. But that's perfectly sensible. Okay, okay. If that's helicopter money, then helicopter money is is a good thing. Yeah. I tend to have in mind when people talk about helicopter money. <laughs> A literal helicopter. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. It's, um, yeah. But, it, yeah. but yeah. the goes back to how do you pay for the war mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, faced with that kind of crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, you create the the liquidity you need in order to deal with it, and worry about clearing it up later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you think the countries are? with how you pay for the war. I think it's very important to recognize that countries uh, incurring this debt, um, you know, that will possibly, uh, especially in cases of Southern European countries, have quite a serious impact on the, on the confidence uh, in the market. And we could in the future, I mean, we already are seeing yields on, on bonds of these countries going up. Uh, how vulnerable are these countries to these developments? And also, how vulnerable are they to speculative attacks that might happen as a result of this? Uh, I think they are very, actually, and this yeah. goes back to what yeah. we were talking earlier about European integration, uh, that Britain or the Netherlands can yeah. take on these levels of additional debt without very serious long-run run consequences. Yeah. Italy and some of the other Southern European countries were uh, uh, already at levels that were very difficult. But why can they take them without consequences? They can't take them without no. consequences. They're taking them now without worrying about the country. I mean, why, why can Britain and, Ger and Netherlands yeah. do it? Yes. Because we're, we're, both our countries are so well within the limits mm -hmm. of what um, everyone knows the British and Dutch governments are capable of repaying. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Okay, I see. And And... I mean, we've already seen uh, some of the consequences of, of, of volatility to not just Italy and Spain, but emerging markets everywhere in the globe. Uh, I mean, countries like India, for example, will be immensely hardly hit, not just by the, the, the health effects, or but, but, but by the sheer economic volatility. Am I right? Yes. And uh, I remember before the euro actually came into full operation, I used to tell students that what, would, what was, was going to happen was that differential inflation risk across countries would be replaced by differential credit risk. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is, the way it worked it, is it wasn't. I mean, it was a ludicrous case. By 2007, markets had virtually no spread between Greek and German yeah. interest rates. Yeah. And that was... And there should have been more willingness at that time to say that this was not what the euro actually meant. But it suited everyone yeah. not to, not to think, no, not to spell that out at that particular time. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, yeah, sorry, carry on, please. No, and we we're now living with the consequences. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. There was a lot of. We may not be able to live with the consequences indefinitely. Wishful. I mean, obviously, we have to accept that a lot of this. Um, Southern European debt is never going to be repaid, mm -hmm. and probably the sooner we do that, the better. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that creating a new generation of European bonds is the right way of dealing with that mm -hmm. particular issue. Yeah. Yeah. And, and another thing that has kind of come up is an in inevitable comparison to countries which have sort of contained the virus, not just uh, the, the health hazards, but also the economic effects. Countries like South Korea, Singapore, and maybe China, although that's a question mark, have kind of dealt with it much more efficiently than many European countries and certainly the United States. 
Um, do you think that we're going to see more of a of a shift in the way uh, in the way we kind of deal with these public health crises now that these countries are shown as examples and they 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 show that they're better adaptive to risk basically? Well, I rather. I rather doubt that because mm. we're, we'll learn when we're able to take more dispassionate analysis of what's been going on, why South Korea, Singapore have dealt with it so much better. But it looks like the related issues of much more authoritarian regimes and cultures, mm -hmm. together with different kinds of social relations between people, mm -hmm. uh, more in a sense, kind of social solidarity that we have typically in Western Europe. Is this no, we're not, not going to change it. Sorry? Is this not dangerous to the democratic societies, the liberal societies, to look overseas and see how supposedly well these regimes are handling these things, uh, the, 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 the crisis, and then be more favorable to uh, authoritarian sort of uh, strong leadership response? There's probably something in that. We, mm. you know, we have a real problem in Europe anyway yeah. of people thinking in that kind of way yeah. that yeah. we'd be better with a more authoritarian leaders. And this will probably give another little bit of, of shift in that direction. Mm. But I don't think we we're basically going to change our cultures and our systems in government, government because of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So just something to keep in mind, I guess, for, for the political discourse. But um, then... Just for the last section of our interview, let's take a look to the future. What uh, do you have perhaps personal recommendations of how Europe and the globe should uh, proceed with this crisis? What are the measures that have not yet been taken and should be taken? You've mentioned the random testing. Um, is there anything more on the sort of economic side of policy making to? I don't think there's anything very novel to be said on the okay. economic side of policy making. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, if I have anything original to offer in this, and it's not a field in which I should have anything very original to offer. And what was that? <laughs> it's emphasizing the huge, the huge economic value of getting better data. Right. Mm. That's both an economic proposition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, and a proposition that is derived from the kind of analysis we did in the book on radical uncertainty. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. But... Um, I understand. And, uh, and as to the length of the recovery period, do you have any, any thoughts uh, of your own of how long that will take? And when can we expect to, to be out of this? Uh, yeah, we can't have the slightest idea because it's not really an economic question. It's, it's a yeah. public health question. Yeah. It depends how this virus evolves and how long we have to have these kinds of lockdown measures in response to it. Right. I see. I see. Um, yeah, maybe before I we kind of conclude the interview, I want to ask something uh, within your book because it seemed to me uh, there was a lot of resemblances uh, in the book with uh, the work of uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who uh, came up with the idea of anti-fragility and black swans, which we discussed. And also, uh, you have a lot of uh, references to Kahneman and Tversky and their theories of heuristics. Uh, in addition to the theories of these authors, uh, what would you say w was the main contribution of your book and sort of the main takeaway for the reader? I think c we, we have a very different take on behavioral economics as, as Kahneman and Tversky. And oddly, mm -hmm. that relates back to us talking earlier about that Paris dinner party. Mm -hmm. Because what had happened there uh, was Alain and the other Europeans were making the critique of uh, these American models, not on the basis that people behaved irrationally, mm -hmm. but, but on the basis that if people behaved in these different ways, it showed that the model of rationality was not an appropriate one. Mm -hmm. So it was, a fault, it was a fault of the model, not the people. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the ten trend in modern economics has been to say that if the world doesn't correspond to the the model, the fault lies with the world rather than the model and behavioral economics has been very much become an example of that it's a list of ways in which people are being stupid but actually we've evolved in ways that are uh, do not make us do not make us stupid many of these so-called biases 
are actually sensible adaptive responses yeah. to a situation of uncertainty mm -hmm. yeah the whole dual yeah. system idea of course of course yes but what is and your take is you said different to that or right no and right and right and the take is that these are not biases but they are sensible responses i am right. i am overconfident and so are most people okay. because actually confidence is a pretty useful attribute to have yeah. mm -hmm. in everyday life my favorite line on this is rational economic demand dies out because nobody would want to mate with him mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, yeah, well, yeah. the concluding question. Yeah, without without uh, maybe trying to predict too much, uh, are you are you optimistic about the the future, especially with how this virus is going? I I I'm not in a position to be optimistic or pessimistic about <laughs> uh, about the virus. Okay. I'm I, I'm optimistic about everything because I'm optimistic about. A, by nature about most things for reasons that I've just been describing is the best way to get through life. Okay. Uh, well, Professor Kay, thank you so much for this interview. Um, and and a big shout out, first of all, to Uva Radio for, for having us uh, and for the audience for listening. Uh, we will be joined next time with uh, Simon Mayer, who's an ecological economist, and we'll be talking more about the impact of coronavirus on the future of work and labor and so on. Uh, so, yeah, with that, I want to thank you again, Professor Kay. Uh, and, um, yeah, stay home, stay safe, everyone. Thank you, and yeah. stay safe, everyone. Thank you.